Good morning. Welcome to the audiobook version of chapter nine, which is your assignment for April the 7th, Tuesday, the, April the 7th. Uh, maybe has decided that she wants to cameo today. She's also on her way uh, to falling asleep for about the fourth nap of the day today, and I'm recording this at 11.52 in the morning. Okay, a couple things before we start chapter nine, which begins on page 85. Chapter nine has the, the strongest language of any chapter, probably. Um, I will be saying beep instead of saying uh, the words in the chapter. It's really important that if you're listening to me for this one, that you're following along with the book too, because I don't want you to miss um, anything. And I just don't feel like it's appropriate for me to say the words out loud on YouTube. Um, but we are gonna talk about the language uh, for the lesson tomorrow too. So um, if you've got some questions or if you're just shocked by it, or confused why um, Harper Lee would write this scene with so much strong language. Hopefully tomorrow our chat um, will answer some of those questions. So we meet somebody new in this chapter. Uh, we meet Cousin Francis, who I don't want to say anything about him yet. I'll let you form your own opinion. Um, we also have Cecil Jacobs, who we might have heard from on like one of the first days of school. Cecil Jacobs is a classmate. Um, in Scout's class, and um, he comes in and out of chapters for the next few. Are you ready, maybe? Alrighty, page 85, chapter 9. You can just take that back, boy. This order given by me to Cecil, Cecil Jacobs was the beginning of a rather thin time for Jem and me. My fists were clenched and I was ready to let fly. Atticus had promised me that he would wear me out if he ever heard of me fighting anymore. I was far too old and too big for such childish things. The sooner I learned to hold it in, the better off everybody would be. I soon forgot. Cecil Jacobs made me forget. He had announced in the schoolyard the day before that Scout Finch's daddy defended Beep. I denied it but told Jem. What do you mean saying that? I asked. Nothing, Jem said. Ask Atticus. He'll tell you. Do you defend Beep, Atticus? I asked him that evening. Of course I do. Don't say Beep, Scout. That's common. We'll talk about what that means in our lesson for tomorrow, or for Tuesday. It's what everybody at school says. From now on, it'll be everybody less one. Well, if you don't want me to grow up talking that way, why do you send me to school? My father looked at me mildly, amusement in his eyes. Despite our compromise, my campaign to avoid school had continued in one form of another since my first day's dose of it. The beginning of last September had brought on sinking spells, dizziness, and mild gastric complaints. I went so far as to pay a nickel for the privilege of rubbing my head against the head of Miss Rachel's cook's son, who was afflicted with, afflicted with a tremendous ringworm. It didn't take. But I was worrying another bone. Do all lawyers defend Negroes, Atticus? Of course they do. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, there was construction outside my house, so I didn't think you'd want to hear that. Of course they do, Scout. Then why did Cecil say you defended Beep? He made it sound like you were running a still. That's going to be a whiskey still. So this is going to be a very, con uh, make him as a very conservative community and drinking is looked down on so she's saying that the way he said what you're doing makes it sound like you're doing something as illegal and looked down upon in maycomb like running a secret whiskey business attica sighed i'm simply defending a negro his name's tom robinson he lives in that little settlement beyond the town dump he's a member of calpurnia's church and cal knows his family well she says they're clean living folks Scout, you aren't old enough to understand some things yet, but there's been some high talk around town to the effect that I shouldn't do much about defending this man. It's a peculiar case. It won't come to trial until summer session. John Taylor was kind enough to give us a postponement. If you shouldn't be defending him, then why are you doing it? For a, m a number of reasons, said Atticus. The main one is, if I didn't, I couldn't hold my head up in town. I couldn't represent this county in the legislature. I couldn't even tell you or Jem not to do something again. You mean if you didn't defend that man, Jem and me wouldn't have to mind you anymore? That's about right. Why? Because I could never ask you to mind me again. 
Scout, simply by the nature of the work, every lawyer gets at least one case in his lifetime that affects him personally. This one's mine, I guess. You might hear some ugly talk about it at school, but do one thing for me, if you will. You just hold your head high and keep those fists down. No matter what anybody says to you, don't let them get your goat. Try fighting with your head for a change. It's a good one, even if it does resist learning. Atticus, are we going to win it? No, honey. Then why? Simply because we were licked, beaten. A hundred years before we started is no reason for us not to try to win, Atticus said. You sound like Cousin Ike Finch, I said. Cousin Ike Finch was Maycomb County's sole surviving Confederate veteran. He wore a General Hood-type beard, of which he was inordinately vain. At least once a year, Atticus Gemini called on him, visited him, and I would have to kiss him. It was horrible. Gemini would listen respectfully to Atticus and Cousin Ike rehash the war. war. We're talking Civil War here. I'll tell you, Atticus, Cousin Ike would say the Missouri Compromise was what got us, but if I had to go through it again, I'd walk every step of the way and every step back just like I did, and furthermore, we'd whip them this time. Now, in 1864, when Stonewall Jackson came around by, I beg your pardon, young folks, old blue eye light was in heaven then. God rest his saintly brow. So that's going to be Cousin Ike Finch uh, reminiscing about his time in the war and then saying that he uh, would have won it. They would win it the next time. Come here, Scout, said Atticus, crawled into his lap and tucked my head under his chin. He put his arms around me and rocked me gently. It's different this time, he said. This time we aren't fighting the Yankees. We're fighting our friends. But remember this. No matter how bitter things get, they're still our friends, and this is still our home. With this in mind, I faced Cecil Jacobs in the schoolyard the next day. You take that back, or are you going to take that back, boy? You got to make me, you got to make me first, he yelled. My folks say your daddy was a disgrace, and that beep ought to hang from the water tank. I drew a bead on him, remembered what Atticus had said, and then dropped my fists and walked away. Scout's a coward, ringing in my ears. It was the first time I ever walked away from a fight. Somehow if I fought Cecil, I would let Atticus down. Atticus so rarely asked Jem and me to do something for him. I could take being called a, a coward for him. I felt extremely noble for having remembered and remained noble for three weeks. Then Christmas came and disaster struck. Jim and I viewed Christmas with mixed feelings. The good side was the tree and Uncle Jack Finch. Every Christmas Eve, we met Uncle Jack at Maycomb Junction and he would spend a week with us. A flip of the coin revealed the uncompromising liniments of Aunt Alexandra and Francis. Remember, Aunt Alexandra is going to be Atticus's sister. Jack, Uncle Jack is Atticus's brother. I suppose I should include Uncle Jimmy and Alexandra's husband, but as he never spoke a word to me in my life except to say, get off the fence, once, I never saw any reason to take notice of him. Neither did Aunt Alexandra. Long ago, in a burst of friendliness, Auntie and Uncle Jimmy pr produced a son named Henry, who left home as soon as was humanly possible, married, and produced Francis. He and his wife deposited Francis at his grandparents every Christmas, then pursued their own pleasures. No amount of sighing could induce Atticus to let us spend Christmas Day at home. We went to Finch's Landing every Christmas in my memory. The fact that Auntie was a good cook was some compensation for being forced to spend a religious holiday with Francis Hancock. He was a year older than I, and I avoided him on principle. He enjoyed everything I disapproved of and disliked my ingenious diversions. Aunt Alexandra was Atticus's sister, but when Jem told me about changelings and siblings, I decided she had been swapped at birth and my grandparents had perhaps re received a Crawford instead of a Finch. Remember, Miss Stephanie Crawford's big uh, gossip in Maycomb. Had I ever harbored the myst mystical notions about mountains that seemed to obsess lawyers and judges, Aunt Alexandra would have been analogous to Mount Everest. Throughout my early life, she was cold and there. I asked maybe if she's still with us. She is. She's just listening, putting her head down on her desk, but she's still listening. When Uncle Jack jumped down from the train Christmas Eve day, we had to wait. What's going on with the lighting all of a sudden? We had to wait for the porter to hand him two long packages. Jim and I always thought it funny when Uncle Jack pecked Atticus on the cheek. They were the only two men we ever saw kiss each other. Uncle Jack shook hands with Jem and swung me high, but not high enough. Uncle Jack was a head shorter than Atticus, the baby of the family. 
He was younger than Aunt Alexandra. He and Auntie looked alike, but Uncle Jack made better use of his face. We were never wary of his sharp nose and chin. He was one of the few men of science who never terrified me, probably because he never behaved like a doctor. Whenever he performed a minor service for Jem and me as removing a splinter from a foot, he would tell us exactly how much what he was going to do, give us an estimation of how much it would hurt, and explain the use of any tongs he employed. One Christmas, I lurked in corners nursing a, split, a twisted splinter in my foot, permitting no one to come near me. When Uncle Jack caught me, he kept me laughing about a preacher who hated going to church so much that he stood at his gate in his dressing gown, smoking a hookah and delivering five-minute sermons to, every passers, to any passers-by who desired spiritual comfort. I interrupted to make Uncle Jack let me know when he would pull it out, but he held up a bloody splinter and a pair of tweezers and said he yanked it while I was laughing, and that was what was known as relativity. What's in those packages? I asked him, pointing to the long, thin parcels the porter had given him. None of your business, he said. Jem said, how's Rose Alamer? Rose Alamer was Uncle Jack's cat. She was a beautiful yellow female. Uncle Jack said was one of the few women he could stand permanently. He reached into his coat pocket and brought out some snapshots. We admired them. She's getting fat, I said. I should think so. She eats all the leftover fingers and ears from the hospital. Oh, that's a damn story, I said. I beg your pardon? Attica said, don't pay any attention to her, Jack. She's been trying you out. Cal says she's been cussing fluently for a week now. Uncle Jack raised his eyebrows and said nothing. I was proceeding on the dim theory, aside from the innate attractiveness of such words, that if Atticus had discovered I'd pick them up at school, he wouldn't let make me go. But at supper that evening, when I asked him to pass the damn ham, please, Uncle Jack pointed at me. See me afterwards, young lady, he said. When supper was over, Uncle Jack went to the living room and sat down. He slapped his thighs for me to come sit on his lap. I liked to smell him. He was like a bottle of alcohol and something pleasantly sweet. He pushed back my bangs and looked at me. You're more like Atticus than your mother, he said. You're also growing out of your pants a little. I reckon they fit all right. You like words like damn and hell now, don't you? I said, I reckon so. Well, I don't, said Uncle Jack, not unless there's extreme provocation connected with them. Provocation is like being provoked. I'll be here a week, and I don't want to hear any words like that while I'm here, Scout. You'll get in trouble if you go around saying things like that. You want to grow up to be a lady, don't you? I said, not particularly. Of course you do. Now let's go to the tree. Sorry, maybe he wants to exit. We decorated the tree until bedtime, and that night I dreamed of the two long packages for Jem and me. Next morning, Jem and I dived for them. They were from Atticus, who had written Uncle Jack to get them for us, and they were what we had asked for. Don't point him in the house, said Atticus, when Jem aimed at a picture on the wall. You have to teach him to shoot, said Uncle Jack. That's your job, said Atticus. I merely bowed to the inevitable, meaning the inevitable of buying the kids their, their first um, air rifle. This is going to be a country town, remember, in uh, rural, well, a rural community. Um, having a gun is going to be um, pretty standard in Maycomb. It took Atticus's, Atticus's courtroom voice to drag us away from the tree. He declined to let us take our air rifles to the landing. I had already begun to think of shooting Francis and said if we made one false move, he'd take him away from us for good. Finch's landing consisted of 360 steps down a high bluff and ending in a jetty. Farther downstream beyond the bluff were traces of an old cotton landing where Finch Negroes had loaded bales and produce, unloaded blocks of ice, flour, sugar, farm equipment, and feminine apparel. A two-rut road ran from the riverside and vanquished among dark trees. At the end of the road was a two-storied white house with porches circling it upstairs and downstairs. In his old age, our ancestor, Simon Finch, had built it to please his nagging wife. But with the porches, all resemblance to ordinary houses of its era had ended. The internal arrangements of the Finch house were indicative of Simon's guilelessness and the absolute trust with which he regarded his offspring. There were six bedrooms upstairs, four for the eight female children, one for Welcome Finch, the sole son, and one for visiting relatives. Simple enough, but the daughter's rooms could be reached only by one staircase. Welcome's room and the guest room only by another. The daughter's staircase was in the ground floor bedroom of their parents, so Simon always knew the out hours of his daughter's nocturnal comings and goings. Basically, all you need to know from this pretty intense description is that uh, 
Simon Finch wanted to make sure his, he knew where his daughters were coming and going, so he made their staircase to like leave the house, go through his bedroom. There was an, a kitchen separate from the back or from the rest of the house, tacked onto it by a wooden catwalk. In the backyard was a rusty bell on a pole used to summon field hands or as a distress signal. A widow's walk on the roof, but no widows walked there. From it, Simon oversaw his overseer, watched the riverboats and gazed into the lives of surrounding land landowners. There went with the house the usual legend about the Yankees. One Finch female, recently engaged, donned her complete trousseau to save it from raiders in the neighborhood. She became stuck in the door of the daughter's staircase, was doused with water, and finally pushed through. When we arrived at the landing, Aunt Alexandra kissed Uncle Jack, Francis kissed Uncle Jack, Uncle Jimmy shook hands silently with Uncle Jack, Jim and I gave our presents to Francis, who gave us a present. Jim felt his age and gravitated to, toward the adults, leaving me to entertain our cousin. Francis was eight and slicked back his hair. What'd you get for Christmas? I asked politely. Just what I asked for, said Fr he said. Francis had requested a pair of knee pants, a red leather book sack, five shirts, and an untied bow tie. That's nice, I lied. Jim and me got air rifles, and Jim got a chemistry set. A toy one, I reckon. No, a real one. He's going to make me some invisible ink, and I'm going to write to Dill in it. Francis asked, what was the use of that? Well, can't you just see his face when he gets a letter from me with nothing in it? It'll drive him nuts. Talking to Francis gave me the sensation of settling slowly to the bottom of the ocean. He was the most boring child I'd ever met. As he lived in Mobile, he could not inform on me to school authorities, but he managed to tell everything he knew to Aunt Alexandra, who in turn unburdened herself to Atticus, who either forgot it or gave me hell, whichever struck his fancy. But the only time I ever heard Atticus speak sharply to anyone was when I once heard him say, Sister, I do the best I can with them. It had something to do with my going around in overalls. So this is going to give us an idea that Aunt Alexandra is uh, trying to uh, stay pretty involved in the way that Scout and Jem are raised. And uh, it stresses Atticus out. Aunt Alexandra was fanatical on the subject of my attire. I could not possibly hope to be a lady if I wore breeches. When I said I could do nothing in a dress, she said I wasn't supposed to be doing things that required pants. Aunt Alexandra's vision of my deportment involved playing with small stoves, tea sets, and wearing the Anna Pearl necklace she gave me when I was born. Furthermore, I should be a ray of sunshine in my father's lonely life. I suggested that one could be a ray of sunshine in pants as well, but Auntie said one had to behave like a sunbeam, and I was born good, but had grown progressively worse every year. She hurt my feelings and set my teeth permanently on edge. But when I asked Atticus about it, he said, there were already enough sunbeams in the family and to go about my business. He didn't mind me much the way I was. At Christmas dinner, I sat at the little table in the dining room. Jem and Francis sat with the adults at the dining table. Auntie had continued to isolate me long after Jem and Francis graduated to the big table. I often wondered what she thought I'd do, get up and throw something. I sometimes thought of asking her if she would let me sit at the big table with the rest of them just once. I would prove to her how civilized I could be. After all, I ate at home every day with no major mishaps. When I begged Atticus to use his influence, he said he had none. We were guests, and we sat where she told us to sit. He also said Anna Alexandra didn't understand girls much. She'd never had one. But her cooking made up for everything. Three kinds of meat, summer vegetables from her pantry shelves, peach pickles, two kinds of cake, and ambrosia constituted a modest Christmas dinner. Afterwards, the adults made for the living room and sat around in a dazed condition. Jem lay on the floor, and I went to the backyard. Put on your coat, said Atticus dreamily, so I didn't hear him. Sorry, that was a terrible Atticus impression. Put on your coat, said Atticus dreamily, so I didn't hear him. Francis sat beside me on the back steps. That was the best yet, I said. Grandma's a wonderful cook, said Francis. She's going to teach me how. Boys don't cook, I giggled at the thought of Jem in an apron. Grandma says all men should learn to cook, and men ought to be careful with their wives and wait on when they don't feel good, said my cousin. I don't want Dill waiting on me, I said. I'd rather wait on him. Dill? Yeah, don't say anything about it yet, but we're going to get married as soon as we're big enough. He asked me last summer. Francis hooted. What's the matter with him, I said. Ain't anything the matter with him. You mean that, old, that little runt Grandma says stays with Miss Rachel every summer? That's exactly who I mean. I know all about him, said Francis. What about him? Grandma says he hasn't got a home. He has two. He lives in Meridian. 
He just gets passed around from relative to relative, and Miss Rachel keeps him every summer. Francis, that's not so. Francis grinned at me. You're mighty dumb sometimes, Jean Louise. Guess you don't know any better, though. What do you mean? If Uncle Atticus lets you run around with stray dogs, that's his business, like Grandma says, so it ain't your fault. I guess it ain't your fault if Atticus is a beep lover besides, but I'm here to tell you it certainly does mortify the rest of the family. Francis, what the hell do you mean? Just what I said. Grandma says it's bad enough that he lets you all run wild, but now that he's turned out to be a beep lover, we'll never be able to walk the streets of Maycomb again. He's ruining the family. That's what he's doing. Francis rose and sprinted down the catwalk to the old kitchen. At a safe distance, he's, he called. He's nothing but a beep lover. He is not, I roared. I don't know what you're talking about, but you'd better cut it out this red hot minute. I leaped off the steps and ran down the catwalk. It was easy to call her, Francis. I said, take it back. Francis jerked loose and sped into the old kitchen. Beep lover, he yelled. When stalking one's prey, it's best to take one's time. Say nothing, and as sure as eggs, he will become curious and emerge. Francis appeared at the kitchen door. You still mad, Jean Louise? He asked tentatively. Nothing to speak of, I said. Francis came out on the catwalk. You gonna take it back, Francis? But I was too quick on, on the draw. Francis shot into the kitchen, so I reti retired to the steps. I could wait patiently. I sat there perhaps five minutes when I heard Anna Alex Alexander speak. Where's Francis? He's out yonder in the kitchen. He knows he's not supposed to play in there. Francis came to the door and yelled, Grandma, she's got me in here and won't let me out. What is all this, Jean Louise? I looked up at Aunt Alexandra. I haven't got him in there, Auntie. I ain't holding him. Yes, she is, shouted Francis. She won't let me out. Have you all been fussing? Jean Louise got mad at me, Grandma, called, out, called Francis. Francis, come out of there. Jean Louise, if I hear another word out of you, I'll tell your father. Did I hear you say hell a while ago? By the way, if Anne Alexandra's hearing her say hell, she's probably hearing what Francis is saying too, which make a mental note that she's not correcting him for that. No, thought I did. I better not hear it again. Aunt Alexandra was a back porch listener. The moment she was out of sight, Francis came out head up and grinning. Don't you fool with me, he said. He jumped into the yard and kept his distance, kicking tufts of grass, turning around occasionally to smile at me. Jem appeared on the porch, looked at us, and went away. Francis climbed the mimosa tree, came down, put his hands in his pockets, and strolled around the yard. Ha, he said. I asked him who he thought he was, Uncle Jack. Francis said he reckoned I got told for me to just sit there and leave him alone. I ain't bothering you, I said. Francis looked at me carefully, concluded that I had been su sufficiently subdued and crooned softly beep lover. This time I split my knuckle to the bone of his front teeth. My left impaired, I sailed in with my right, but not for long. Uncle Jack pinned my arms to my sides and said, stand still. Aunt Alexander ministered to Francis, wiping his tears with her handkerchief, rubbing his hair, patting his cheek. Atticus, Jem, and Uncle Jimmy had come to the back porch when Francis started yelling. Who started this? said Uncle Jack. Francis and I pointed at each other. Grandma, he bawled. She called me a whore lady and jumped on me. Is that true, Scout? asked Uncle Jack. Is that true? I reckon so. When Uncle Jack looked down at me, his features were like Aunt Alexandra's. You know I told you you'd get in trouble if you used words like that. I told you, didn't I? Yes, sir, but, well, you're in trouble now. Stay there. I was debating whether to stand or run and tarried in, in, in indecision a moment too long. I turned to flee, but Uncle Jack was quicker. I found myself suddenly looking at a tiny ant struggling with a bread crumb in the, in the grass. I'll never speak to you again as long as I live. I hate you and despise you and hope you die tomorrow. A statement that seemed to encourage Uncle Jack more than anything. I ran to Atticus for some comfort, but he, comfort, but he said I had it coming and it was high time we went home. I climbed into the back seat of the car without saying goodbye to anyone. And at home, I ran to my room and slammed the door. Jem tried to say something nice, but I wouldn't let him. When I surveyed the damage, there were only seven or eight red marks, and I was reflecting upon relativity when someone knocked on the door. I asked who it was. Uncle Jack answered, Go away. Uncle Jack said if I talked like that, he'd get in there. He'd pretty, right there, he means like I'd like slap you or punish you again. So I was quiet. 
When he entered the room, I retreated to a corner and turned my back on him. Scout, he said, do you still hate me? Go on, please, sir. Well, I didn't think you'd hold it against me, he said. I'm disappointed in you. You had that coming and you know it. Didn't either. Honey, you can't go around calling people. You ain't fair, I said. You ain't fair. Uncle Jack's eyebrows went up. Not fair? How not? You're real nice, Uncle Jack, and I reckon I love you even after what you did, but you don't understand children much. Uncle Jack put his hands on his hips and looked down at me. And why do I not understand children, Miss Jean Louise? Such conduct as yours required little understanding. It was obstreperous, disorderly, and abusive. You gonna try you gonna give me a chance to tell you? I didn't mean to sass you. I'm just trying to tell you. Uncle Jack sat down on the bed. His eyebrows came together and he peered at me from under them. Proceed, he said. I took a deep breath. Well, in the first place, you never stopped to give me a chance to tell my side of it. You just lit right into me. When Jem and I fuss, Atticus doesn't ever just listen to Jem's side of it. He hears mine too. And in the second place, you told me to never use words like that except in extreme provocation. And Francis provocated me enough to knock his block off. She's using the wrong word there, provocated. She means provoked. Uncle Jack scratched his head. What was your side of it, Scout? Francis called Atticus something, and I wasn't about to take it off of him. What did Francis call him? A beep lover. I ain't very sure what it means, but the way Francis said it. Tell you one thing right now, Uncle Jack, I'll beep. I swear before God if I'll sit there and let them say something about Atticus. He called Atticus that? Sir, he did, and, and a lot more. Said Atticus would be the ruination of the family, and he let Jem and me run wild. From the look on Uncle Jack's face, I thought I was in for it again. When he said, we'll see about this. I knew Uncle Francis, or I knew Francis was in for it. I have a good mind to go out there tonight. Please, sir, just let it go, please. I have no intention of letting it go, he said. Alexander should know about this. The idea of, wait till I get my hands on that boy. Uncle Jack, please promise me something, please, sir. Promise you won't tell Atticus about that, this. He, he asked me one time not to let anything I heard about him make me mad, and I'd rather him think we were fighting about something else instead. Please, I promise. But I don't like Francis getting away with something like that. He didn't. You reckon you could tie up my hand? It's still bleeding some. So by that she means he didn't because I punched him in the face. Of course I will, baby. I know. If no other hand, I'd be more delighted to tie up. Would you come this way? Uncle Jack gallantly bowed me to the bathroom. While he cleaned and bandaged my, bandaged my knuckles, he entertained me with a tale about a funny, nearsighted old gentleman who had a cat named Hodge, who counted all the cracks in the sidewalk when he went to town. There now, he said, you have a ti very tiny, a very unlike, whoa, sorry. You'll have a very unlikely scar on your wedding ring finger. Thank you, sir. Uncle Jack? Ma'am? What's a whore lady? Uncle Jack plunged into another long tale about an old prime minister who sat in the House of Commons and blew feathers in the air and tried to keep them all up, keep them there, when all the men about around him were losing their heads. I guess he was trying to answer my question, but he made no sense whatsoever. Later, when I was supposed to be in bed, I went down the hall for a drink of water and heard Atticus and Uncle Jack in the living room. I shall never marry Atticus. Why? I might have children. Atticus said, you've a lot to learn, Jack. I know. Your daughter gave me her, my first lesson this afternoon. This is one of my favorite parts in the whole book. The rest of this chapter. She did, said I didn't understand children much and told me why. She was quite right. Atticus, she told me how I should have treated her. Oh, dear, I'm so sorry I rocked on her. Atticus chuckled. She earned it, so don't feel too remorseful. I waited on tender hooks for Uncle Jack to tell Atticus my side of it, but he didn't. He simply murmured, her use of bathroom invective, potty language, leads nothing, leaves nothing to the imagination, but she doesn't know the meaning of half she says. She asked me what a whore lady was. Did you tell her? No, I told her about Lord Melbourne. Jack, when a child asks you something, answer him for goodness sake, but don't make a, make a production of it. Children are children, but they can spot an evasion quicker than adults, and evasion simply muddles them, meaning like uh, trying to avoid um, an explanation. No, my father mused. You had the right answer this afternoon, but the wrong reasons. Bad language is a stage all children go through, and it dies with time when they learn they're not attracting attention with it. Hot headedness isn't. Scout's got to learn to keep her head and learn it soon with what's in store for her these next few months. She's coming along, though. 
Jem's getting older and she follows his example a good bit now. All she needs is assistance sometimes. Atticus, you've never laid a hand on her. I admit that. So far, I've been able to get by with threats. Jack, she minds me as well as she can. Doesn't come up to scratch half the time, but she tries. That's not the answer, said Uncle Jack. No, the answer is that she knows that I know she tries. That's what makes the difference. What bothers me is that she and Jem will have to absorb some pretty ugly things soon. I'm not worried about Jem keeping his head, but Scout is Scout just as soon jump on someone as, ta as look at him if her pride's at stake. I waited for Uncle Jack to break his promise. He still didn't. Atticus, how bad is this going to be? You haven't had too much chance to discuss it. It couldn't be worse, Jack. The only thing we've got is a black man's word against the Yules. The evidence boils down to, you did, I didn't. The jury couldn't possibly be expected to take Tom Robinson's word against the Yules. Are you acquainted with the Yules? Uncle Jack said yes, he remembered them. He described them to Atticus, but Atticus said, you're a generation off. The present ones are the same, though. What are you going to do, then? Before I'm through, I intend to jar the jury a bit. I think we'll have a reasonable chance on appeal, though. I really can't tell at this stage, Jack. You know, I'd hoped I'd get through life without a case of this kind, but John Taylor pointed at me and said, you're it. Let this cup pass from you, eh? It's going to be a, a religious allusion to um, the Garden of Eden. Not the Garden of Eden, Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, biblical quote. Right, but you think I could face my children otherwise? You know what's going to happen as well as I do, Jack, and I hope and pray I can get Jem and Scout through it without bitterness and most of all, without catching Maycomb's usual disease. Why reasonable people go stark raving mad with, when anything involving a Negro comes up is something I can't pretend to understand. I just hope that Jem and Scout come to me for their answers instead of listening to the town. I hope they trust me enough. Jean Louise? My scalp jumped. I stuck my head around the corner. Sir? Go to bed. I scurried to my room and went to bed. Uncle Jack was a prince of a fellow not to let me down. But I never figured out how Atticus knew I was listening. And it wasn't until many years later that I realized that he wanted to, me to hear every word he said. I will see you for chapter 10.